live from the backstretch at historic Saratoga Racecourse. This is Saturdays at the Spa with Brian Natto. Saturdays at the Spa is brought to you by CapitalOTBBet.com, New York's premier wagering site. CapitalOTBBet.com. Sign up today. The new Capital Mobile app. Wager anywhere, anytime. Download it free from the iTunes Store or Google Play. Good morning and welcome to Saturdays at the Spa. Brian Natto with you here uh, on a glorious Whitney morning. Uh, different day and age. Anthony Mormino just left with me and... Uh, it's a beautiful day. The crowd would be here if they could. They can't. It is, uh, it is what it is. It's unfortunate, but that doesn't mean you, you can't come out uh, in some way, shape, or form. We have a phenomenal card. Of course, the Whitney uh, with Thomas Day Tot is, is going to, you know, the highlight of the day, but we've got the Alan Jerkins as well, and then, of course, Midnight Bizu earlier on the card in the personal ensign, and Jeff Bloom, co-owner of her, is going to join me in a second. But right off the rip, happy to uh, welcome back Al Stahl, trainer of Tom's Day Tot. Third year in a row uh, on Saturdays at the spa. So I guess if, if nothing else, I'm bugging your phone. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. When you get called this tent over here in the corner, uh, something's going your way. <laughs> um, and things are going your way. I mean, how many did you bring up here? You select stable, but the, the horses are running, huh? Yeah, eight. And okay. I've done a little bit of shuffling, but they're running well. And uh, we might have picked the right bunch this year, okay. which is... Uh, you th it's a lot more difficult than it looks. Yeah, and well, you, you mentioned picking the right bunch. Um, I mean, did, did you, you kind of go down the roster, it, what's in the stall, and who's coming up here, and who's staying? As, a dip, as I mentioned, it's a, not a lot of Kentucky guys came up. It's kind of a different different year. You know, how, how has it worked out that who you got up here and, and dealing with the, the, the state of affairs, basically? Right, well, yeah, yeah it's a little bit different. I, I Personally, I wasn't going to skip out on Saratoga. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't going to happen. Uh, so we uh, I assembled a crew and didn't take no for an answer. Right. And so we got the, the people up here that wanted to be here, and uh, that's all worked out well. And as far as the horses go, I literally wait to the very last minute okay. uh, because you get the condition book out kind of late, and sometimes I made a change almost when the vans pull up. I just you want to bring a sound horse up and wouldn't with a race to point four. Right. So it's uh, it's to me it's very last minute and. We throw them all together and bring them up and see what happens. Um, we'll get right to it. We're going to show video of Tom's Day Tot winning the Alley Dar uh, last year up here. And you, you talk about Saratoga. I, I can't imagine there's a, a horse in your barn that's more accustomed to Saratoga. He's three for four up here. He's won here in 2016, 17. We see the Alley Dar here. So uh, I would think he's, he's taken nicely up here. Yeah, no, he obviously likes Saratoga. <clears throat> Excuse me. He. Um, he just does well up here. I can tell he's only been up here about, uh, uh, it's been almost two weeks, and he just, um, he does better. His eyes look better. His hair looks great. His weight is good. And with the new surface, I thought it might be good to get him up here and let him gallop over for about a week or so. And I was thrilled with his breeze. And I'm like everybody else. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with the new surface that Nair put in this year. It looks like, it looks like it's going to be something very beneficial long okay. term to uh, the it, racing here. I mean, as a handicapper, just watching races, it seems like it's been playing pretty fair uh, as a whole. Yeah, I'm, I'm just watching too. I yeah. mean, we've run more turf You've for been whatever on turf reason. Winners, yeah. Yeah, but uh, um, I've heard some people say that it's a little speed and the, the kickback kind of bothers the horses. So, but I, I've seen some closers run well. So I haven't talked to any jocks about it, but just from what I have to deal with, right. soundness, taking the rain, organizing the ro the works and the gallops. I'm, I'm thrilled with it. They've done a, they've done a great job, and and they should be commended. You, you mentioned uh, how it seems Tom Zetat is, is doing better here. I, I, everybody I talk to, it seems like the horses get here and they just take to it. They like it. What, what is it about upstate New York or the atmosphere that seems to have a lot of horses thriving? Well, I think it's uh, trees and grass and and, and nice weather, uh, combination of all that and. Uh, there's a lot to see up here, so it takes a certain type. I've brought horses up in the past that kind of get freaked out with all the things that happen mm -hmm. here. It's a little quiet this year, but in general, as you well know, there's a lot of cars and peoples and tours sure. and horses going all over everywhere. 
and uh, most of them get used to it, but I've had a couple that didn't particularly like it, but it, it's just Saratoga. I think the humans are similar to the horses, yeah. and we just get more comfortable here and enjoy ourselves, and, uh, and, and we all do well. If you can't like it up here, you're, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, right? you need, I mean, you need to do something else. If, I mean, if you're a racing person and, uh, and you don't like Saratoga, um, you, need to, you really need to do something else. Uh, seven years old now, so Tom's day, Todd, and, and uh, the first thing that, that comes to mind, I mean, we don't see this a lot, first and foremost. So, so, you know, I mentioned in 2006 he broke his maiden up here. There's been a lot of starts and stops. Uh, Tom's day, Todd, at three in 2016, and now, uh, you know, Three to five in the Whitney. What's the progression been like from that young horse that, that took some time, certainly, to get to this point? Right. Well, we stopped on him out of necessity. It's not like we said, oh, Tom, you know, we love you so much, sure. we're going to give you six months off. Right. Uh, we loved him, but we had to stop. And uh, what we saw on a day to day basis, training, and he showed in the afternoon, we knew there was some brilliance there. We could just tell. You can tell those things. We got 50 horse stable. Yeah. You know, and the horse will stand out like a sore thumb, and the riders will come back with eyes like saucers and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, we knew he was worth persevering with. And uh, the, the GMB, they were whenever something would happen, it was minor. Yeah. Sometimes you'll you know go to the clinic and they'll say, well, we'll fix him, but don't plan on running him anymore. But every time you come back and they say, okay, this went well and that went well, and I don't see much here. And he's actually got pretty looking legs. I mm -hmm. mean, the joints look great. The, there's no heat or inflammation. He just had. Uh, some traumatic type things happen, I guess, and and as a, as far as his progression from three till now, uh, we always saw the, the brilliance when he got a chance to run, and and I think what's made him what he is today is the fact that he's been really good for about two straight years, right. and he's he's got some continuity, he's got some rhythm, he's stringing races together, he's stringing works together, and I think it just made him a, a, the warrior that he is, yeah. and the talent has always been there, now it's all put together, and. And I think that one of the reasons he's here also is he had a great winter. We actually gave him a legitimate vacation. Mm -hmm. No surgeries, no paintings, no blistering, nothing. He just went to the fairgrounds, and we let him down and picked him up. And he didn't miss a day, didn't miss a note, and he hasn't missed a note all year. So uh, I think that's why he's here today. We're going to uh, first <clears throat> big win. I mean, he won the Fayette, but then we'll show footage here of him winning the Clark, which, Al, it had to be great for you and the team and, and, and certainly – the Bensons, um, to after all the hard work, the stops, the starts, to, to really answer the bell and you know get that grade one that I'm sure is the whole reason you kept bringing him back because you saw this kind of talent. Yeah, no, we, we thought he was a grade one type talent, and we contemplated the Breeders' Cup in California for maybe the mile, not necessarily the classic, but that quickly we brushed that aside and went Fayette Clark, and he just did so well. I mean, the, the, the race that really put some hair on his chest, so to speak, was at Woodward. Mm -hmm. Uh, he won the Alley Dog very easily in the Woodward. He had an awkward trip, and Irad, you know, rode a good race. He just was in a, in a tough spot with the pace, and he ended up wide, and he fired really, really hard and got to be a length and changed to a great horse in Jimmy Jerkins' uh, preservationist. Yep. And uh, after that race, he was just dialed in. I mean, the, 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 the Fayette and the Clark were basically foregone conclusions right. if he was going to stay together. So, uh um, that's that's what that's what you know made us go that direction. We got the grade one, and and we just couldn't be more excited to be exactly where we are. We wanted this to be the third race off his comeback, right. and while we had to zig and zag because of COVID, uh, he ended up getting a, a prep at Oak Lawn and a, and the Foster, which was a, you know blew everybody's mind. And yeah. here we are in the third race in our cycle. I think it's uh, what three races in 248 days, right. which is. A, perfect freshening and so he's ready to go we'll uh we'll show the foster now and you know the clark was a big run and then he got the job done at oakland uh seven years old 18th start i mean this was another level which was that fair to say without no and we didn't expect it really we right. thought he'd win we thought he'd run his race and not to uh, cut you off just while they're watching at home he's a lot closer here as well in this trip right well he's an athletic horse he's big like he is he leaves the gate on mm -hmm. his toes so that's a good thing. Hope he does that this afternoon. And he, uh, you know, Miguel knew that they weren't going too fast, and uh, we thought maybe the couple uh, Calhoun horses, one might uh, uh, push a little harder, and we found ourselves in an absolute dream spot going 48 and change for a half, and it was kind of over early. 
uh, by my standards, is kind of chasing you on the outside. He's back for more today. Um, obviously, the long shot, Mr. Buff, is going to the front. Joel knows this, your horse, back aboard today, Joel Rosario, uh, who nobody's riding better here, that's for sure. Um, do you have a plan in mind, or Joe, mm. that's for Joel? Yeah, that's Joel. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel, my, I haven't even talked to Joel, but my guess would be when he saw the five out of five, he had to just lick his chops and mm -hmm. say, I like that. I'm sure it'll help him away from the gate. And my guess would be that, by my standards, is going to have a little different strategy than he did uh, in the uh, in the foster coming out the one hole with Jose, I expect that horse to be to go a little bit to go a little bit and just so I mean he, Joel like I said he's an instinctive rider, he'll make the call on the fly uh, off the break and uh, I'm that's of all the things to worry about with, with uh, horses and how they're eating and how they're moving and all that. Yeah. Uh, Joel Rosario in this particular spot is not even anything not even him crossed my mind and, and just to folks watching this race again as a point of reference um, you know a lot of people wanted to see Midnight Bijou in the Whitney and you know that let's run her against Tom's day dot uh, Tom ran nine lengths faster going the exact same distance about 32 minutes later I won't put you on the spot because Midnight Bijou is a great horse but uh, this was just a, a I mean, this was the race of the year for, 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 my, for my money. I mean, th that was the definitive performance in the division. Well, it, it caught us off guard. We were, we were trying to just creep up the ladder a little mm -hmm. bit, and he had run, I think he had 136 days between the Clark and the uh, Oaklawn Mile, and then he had another 77 days, which is, what, 213 days. Yeah. Second race in 213 days, you don't expect to get uh, .02 uh, off of a 21-year-old yeah. track record. So, um I was, we were just blown away. He did it easily. And he's come out of it well. I mean, theoretically, he's supposed to maybe react is somewhat. There, but, is there uh, a worry there? Well, I worry because you just hear about it, but he's right. a big, strong, solid, class horse. And, uh, I mean, if he reacts, maybe it's still good enough. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, um, it just was a little bit more than we expected, but who'd expected that? Right, right. Um, Obviously, the Breeders' Cup at, at Keeneland is the, the end-all, be-all, I would think. Uh, and I know you don't want to get too far uh, ahead of yourselves, but in the perfect world, do you have a progression? You're working backwards from there? Uh, not really, because like, Keeneland Stakes schedule hasn't come out. Right. I know the things are shuffled around a little yeah. bit, and uh, I know the Lucas Classic, Lucas Classic has been on hiatus. It's, okay. it's off. Uh, so you know, we'll just run today, and uh, he, could do, he could come back to New York. Not not the Woodward, but maybe the Jockey Club. He could mm -hmm. do that like Blaine did. He could possibly try wherever the Fayette might end up at, at, at Keeneland. Uh, or he, who knows? He runs unbelievably well fresh. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have all the confidence in the world. I know that'd be, you know, what, 90, about 95 days or something that, like that. So, yeah. who, you know, who's to say? But, I mean, I anything's on the table, but right. we're just completely focusing on today. Um, you mentioned Blaine, so Bri, if we could, let's pull up that Whitney in, in, in 2010. Al knows the winner's circle uh, for the Whitney. Uh, in a lot like uh, Tom's Day Top, maybe in the Foster, or certainly the Clark, I mean, this was, I mean, you were seeing Blaine's 3-1 to one here. I mean, this was kind of his coming out party. Was that safe to say after, you know, he hadn't yet reached the heights he was going to hit? Right, right. Well, he, he ran extremely well winning the grade one in the Foster. It was a grade one back then, and uh, he beat a nice Todd Pletcher horse, who made an easy lead with a slow pace and ran him down from I think the 11 or 12 hole, mm -hmm. and and that was his second race off the bench, and it really really tightened him up well. So um, I'm hoping we have the same type of uh, effort here. But yeah, this is exciting. Look at the old school this, graphics. Huh? Don't yeah. you like that? Look at the. And this and is a loose quality road that you're running down. It was yeah, just a monster right, of a right. Horse I mean, a lot of people point. said uh, he went too slow on the front end, and I just that concept doesn't even register with yeah. me. I mean. I mean, quality road on the front end going a half mile and 48 and change. Yeah, you take your chances. I'll take that, that, right? take that uh, 101 <laughs> times out of 100. Um, you, you are set up uh, for, for a big day here. You've got, uh, I, I picked you earlier on the card um, in the turf race, and then in the nightcap at, at 720, they're going to keep you around, hopefully after a little champagne with a Whitney win, they're going to keep you around for the uh, caress. We've got footage uh, of, of the license fee with uh, Delica, who came up a little short um, trying to run down I'll handle the cash both of them back today cutting back a half, <laughs> yeah, if you can see it describe what we're seeing here Al. exactly um, exactly I had no up a half for a long time I had no idea that I know she was last right here and Joel wants to go around him but a horse backs him right there and so he says okay well I got to stay in there and you know she's just not freewheeling it right there there's a little pinch there and and she has to split horses and he 
gets a run a little later. I'm sure he wanted to. And um, Ron Anderson said his agent, if they've run this race uh, 100 times, she would have won it 99 times. Right. And I'm not exactly uh, sure he might not be right. But that's okay. I mean, she that's racing, and she fired. Right. And, and it's going to be the same way today. Right. Uh, the trip horse wins it. Uh, whether it's us, uh, hopefully it's us, but I think uh, that's what it's going to be like again today. And Joel, for, for my money, rides turf sprints better than anyway. He's such a powerful finisher. I would think he, he fits this. Yeah, this field, this field is finishing really sharply uh, around one turn. Yeah. She ran some nice two-turn races, but she's a little rank, and she doesn't quite listen to the rider uh, when they're going 48. She kind of gets her head up and pulls too hard, so we backed her up to where if they go 22 and change, and she's not going to be pulling and rushing right. on the lead, so he just sits on and he'll gather her up, and, and she should fire a good shot today, and if she gets the right path, uh, she's got a tremendous chance. Uh, quickly, before I let you go, you mentioned there's eight up here. You won with the firster on the turf. Any names that we went, might want to look up? I mean, you've had um, two-year-olds in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I brought a pair of Colts up here, uh, a nice Colt for Claiborne Farm and Dil Mrs. Dill Snyder. Um, he's half brother to Lee okay. by Spitestown. His name is Foliage. He, he's a sharp horse, most probably. I like to run my two year olds one time up yeah. here. Just get him up here, get him acclimated. And uh, he's kind of a forward type of horse. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we like him. And I've got a big, long, leggy colt by Mucho Macho Man, who's. I've never had a two year old that we bought at a two year old training sale grow so much after a sale. Mm -hmm. We bought him in March. Keith Dickey bought him for me. Uh, I was going down there, but. All heck right. broke loose at that sure. time, especially in New Orleans. So I scrapped my trip, and uh, he he did the dirty work for me, the leg work, and bought us a really really nice colt, who is going to run maybe six and a half here on the fifteenth. Okay. He'll work tomorrow, and uh, so his name is Mystical Man. So I've got two nice colts, and that's all we brought in the two year old part. How does that work? Because typically the two year olds in training, they're very forward. They're they're pretty much ready to run, and then then a horse blows up and grows on you. What, do you have to take a step back a little? Well, bit? We, we we take we take a step back automatically okay. after the sale. We send them to uh, Skylight Training Center, home of uh, Art Collector. Okay. Uh, so Tommy Drury uh, keeps a when he's not looking Art Collector, he's, keep, <laughs> he's keeping. He's got better things to do. He's right keeping now. an eye on yeah. our horses, hopefully. So. Uh, and I saw him, I was up in, in Louisville in um, early March, and he was kind of a weedy type of horse, and then we went back down the fairgrounds, and next time I saw him, in about six weeks later, I mean, it was really, it was dramatic, the okay. change in the colt. And he's filled out to be a, a nice, really nice looking horse, who will look better in another 60 days. Right. So uh, uh, we're kind of looking forward to him, and uh, I'm actually going to work those two colts tomorrow uh, together, so um, we're excited. And you're a patient guy, and you mentioned, you know, like to get a start up here, and obviously up here, that's one turn on the dirt, but the Churchill races are a two turn, so again, we're all the progression kind of. Yeah, yeah, I've, 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 I've done here, and either run at Churchill, uh, towards the end or just Keeneland. It right. just all depends how things shake out. So if you like action, you want to be in Kentucky from yeah. September 1st on. It's a good spot from, to be. From, from, that, from September 1st to December 1st, yeah. it's on. Right. And uh, hopefully uh, in uh, early November, Tom's Day Tot will have you there uh, front and center at Keeneland. That's that's the ultimate goal. Al Stahl, appreciate it. Uh, third year in a row on Saturdays at the spot. So this year especially, thank you for taking the time to, to sit in that chair. It means a lot. Yeah, Best no, no, my pleasure. I've, yeah. I've always come here. I was, I was, I'm very happy to run into Anthony on the way out. Uh, we go back a long way. And, uh, I never hear that from people. Huh? Yeah, well, I mean, you see, <laughs> maybe I like him on TV better. We love Anthony. <laughs> He's our boy. We love Anthony. He's been here for forever. And you said, what, about 25 years you've known him? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I came in 96 my first year, and he just said 98. Okay, so there you go. Uh, you, when you meet Anthony once, you know, you know you who he is. will know who he is. Whether it's his clothes or just him, you yes. know. Uh, yeah, he's a good boy. man. Absolutely. Uh, Al Stahl, Tom's Data in the Whitney. It'll bring us to our first break here on Saturdays at the Spot. When we come back, Jeff Bloom, co-owner of Midnight Beast. Stay tuned. They're off in the personal ensign, and Coach Rocks comes out on the lead. Elite is up close, too. Between those two, it's She's a Julie. These three will take them into the first turn with Wildcat right behind them in a wide run for Golden Award. Midnight Bizu will settle at the rear of the field early on, biding her time in the early stages here, some six and a half lengths off of front-running Coach Rocks, who's setting the pace under Luis Saez. On to the backstretch, Coach Rocks runs a quarter in 23.46 seconds. A solid first fraction here. She's a Julie is running along in second onto the backstretch. Elate is third. Golden Award fourth between horses. Then Wildcat on the inside. And Mid Mike Smith and Midnight Bizu at the rear of the field here, racing five lengths off the lead as they continue the run up the backstretch. 
Coach Rocks out there isolated on a two-length advantage on She's a Julie. A late and Jose Ortiz sit third on the backstretch here. They're two and a half lengths off the lead. Wildcat who's fourth on the inside. Midnight Bizu is just alongside of Golden Award at the back of the pack. 47.88 was the half. They're inside the half-mile pole. Coach Rocks continues to lead the way by a length and a half. She's a Julie in a late heads apart second and third. And then it's Wildcat. Midnight Bizu is fifth. She's moving now. And a late is two as they make their way to the top of the stretch. And now a late makes her move for the lead. And Midnight Bizu comes blasting on the outside after her. These two will turn for home together. Coach Rocks has faded to third. She's a Julian Wildcat on the inside. They're into the stretch. And it's a late to catch. Midnight Bizu, her fearsome foe, comes at her on the outside. And these two lay it on the line with a 16th to go. A late on the inside. Midnight Bizu on the outside. They're coming to the wire. Who's it going to be? Oh, <laughs> it's so close. It's so close. Was it Midnight Bizu? No track, no problem. There's no better place to follow the Saratoga race meet than Capital OTB and OTB TV. With our live TV shows from the Saratoga backstretch and our live remotes, all the information you need is right here. Each and every day of the Saratoga meet, we talk with all the top trainers, jockeys, handicappers, and racing personalities. So stay with Capital OTV and OTV TV this racing season and win more. Where's the best place to find your favorite teams, your favorite food, daily drink specials, and wagering on live horse racing? Legends Field Sports Bar, 711 Central Avenue, Albany. Get your game on day or night with 75 flat screen TVs, tournament style pool tables, a private banquet room, and live horse racing. So if someone asks you where's the best sports bar in the capital region, tell them Legends Field Sports Bar, inside the Clubhouse Race Book, 711 Central Avenue, Albany. Stone is an upside front. They're coming down to the finish. Can Smarty Jones hold on? Here comes Birdstone. Birdstone surges past. Birdstone wins the Belmont Stakes. Good morning and welcome back to Saturdays at the Spa. Brian Natto with you on Whitney Day here at uh, Saratoga and a different different feel to it, obviously, uh, w without without crowds, but a just an action-packed superstar graded stakes uh, lineup today. And it, super happy to have Al Stahl uh, again. On. He's been great. He's third year in a row with uh, Tom's Day Tot now, who's, who's clearly... Uh, the horse to beat uh, in the Whitney, and the, you know, the, arguably the best handicapped horse uh, we have in, in the country. And uh, I'm happy to be joined now by Jeff Bloom, co-owner of Midnight Bijou, who's certainly the the clubhouse leader of the Distaff Division. And uh, we'll welcome in uh, Jeff via the phone. Uh, is is on the down low in uh, Saratoga. Jeff, welcome to Saturdays at the Spa, uh, Whitney Day, and certainly Midnight Views in front and center in the personal ensign as well. Hey, it's great to be here. Um, going into the break, we showed, uh, we showed uh, video footage of the personal ensign last year, and, and uh, you know, Midnight Views had, had come in winning multiple grade ones, but Jeff, before we get going on 2020, just looking back at that race last year and what was, you know, it, it's going to go down in, in the annals of, of Saratoga history. I mean, the fact that, that her in a late, just an absolute throw-it-down war, what was going through your mind off the far turn in the personal ensign last year? Uh, you don't want to know. <laughs> but, uh, no, look, we knew we were coming in against a formidable foe um, and, you know, arguably on a late home course. Um, I, I certainly wasn't concerned about the added distance, um, but it was at a distance that, um, on paper, certainly favored a late. Um, but, you know, to, to talk about just an epic uh, stretch duel between those two, just, you know, looking back as a race fan, um, you know, you have such a fond appreciation for those kinds of races. And, and to be able to um, battle it out, down the entire length of the stretch to superstar mares and, and end up being on the winning side was just 
as rewarding an experience as you can imagine. But but I can tell you that that stretch duel felt like it lasted an eternity for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was it was one of those things where you know you felt you had a shot, and then and then they were just going toe to toe, and uh, there was just a huge. Um, amount of relief when when they posted up our number as the winner yeah it was tough to tell live and it's you know you hear the old adage you know doesn't deserve a loser and that was was certainly uh the case there i, I guess jeff we'll, we'll start from the beginning you know at midnight bizu an eighty thousand uh, dollar daughter of, of midnight lou 21 to 1 when running second um in her debut you, you bought her uh, what what stood out or, or what did and certainly what did you think when you when you bought her, I mean, we have we have reached epic heights here. But back in the day when it all started um, out in California, what were your impressions early on of Midnight Bijou? Well, look, you, you know, you always hope that when you uh, make a decision to buy a horse, that you're making the right decision and you're going to have a multiple graded stake winner on your hands. But but um, being a realist, we all know how tough this game is. Uh, when when I, when I purchased Midnight um, back uh, when she was a two year old, there were. A number of qualities that stood out for me you know I get asked the question all the time well you know what was it about her and you know some of its um, hard data science and and a lot of its um, you know the intangibles that are hard to communicate or explain but the Philly had such an amazing presence and and presence uh, you know of mind in terms of you know just her, her eye her look the way she handled herself and 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 also her fluidity of motion and and um, the way she um, handled herself before, during, and after she had the showcase. So it was a combination of a lot of things, and and so at the end of the day, we got very lucky. And um, you know, when I look back, the, the the funny thing is, is going into the the ring when it was time to start bidding, I really wasn't certain we were going to be able to afford her. You know, the sale was strong, and and I just you know I thought there would be more attention on her than there was and when the hammer dropped at 80 i was as relieved as you can ever imagine did, did you have a number in mind jeff like you know thinking easier said than done but did you did you say kind of to yourself well the philly's going to go for this or and then you know that that would be above what we went, wanted to pay that's a great question because i always assign a value to a horse before i go into the auction ring and with midnight I really don't know. I know I would have gone above and beyond what my limit would have been going into the ring. And I asked myself all this all the time about this, like, what would I have stopped at? Right. And it probably would have ended up being at something like 150. Okay. Um, you know, I cringe when I think about it. It might have come to something like that. But at the end of the day, she went for um, well below. You know, I, th I really thought she was going to be in, in like the 110, 120 price range. Uh, and I would have gone above that. I just don't know how far I would have. Right. Well, luckily it didn't come to that. Uh, you mentioned that the sales ring, and and um, before we get to 2020, uh, you know, Midnight Bijou was supposed to, to make another appearance in a sales ring. You had her entered at Keeneland November in the face of tip, facing Tipton sale. Um, ultimately decided to withdraw her. Um, it seems like a pretty darn good move now, Jeff, but looking back on it, um, and first and foremost, I, I think it's a great, sportsmanship gesture money aside just to see you know i had al stall on before uh we got you and you know tom's day Tot seven years old and now uh midnight bees you five years old it's not something you see too too often so I, I think you know you should be commended for that but she was supposed to go through the ring what kind of you know i'm sure you huddled with the team and, and steve and he probably said you know she's she's doing as good as she ever has been what was the thinking about not uh, going through with it yeah, you know, at the time, I'm sure pretty much everybody said you must be, you know, a crazy idiot for making that kind of decision. Um, we were laboring over the notion of, of not being able to have this experience continue past November. And throughout the year, as things continue to progress, we just sort of put it out of our mind. And, you know, I had hinted around quite a bit about, well, you know, maybe maybe we don't have to do this and just just as a fan of horses like this there's such an appreciation to be able to go out there and you know perform on the stage like they do and we were enjoying it so much and you know the most important thing was the health fitness and condition of midnight and coming into the breeders cup she couldn't have been doing any better and she just loves her job and 
it, it was right before um, you know we were getting ready to um, um, you know go ahead and run that we just said look you had to make that decision before the race is that correct yeah yeah um, the Breeders Cup race and we wanted to make the decision prior to the Breeders Cup to her actual race because um, in no way shape or form was the decision predicated on her performance in that race and so we were relieved when we came to that um, decision and of course I talked it over with Steve making sure that you know physically this was um, something that made sense and 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 you're right fortunately we got um, rewarded for that and and hopefully racing benefits from it and I know this much and it's, it's really gratifying to see the number of fans that reach out to us about our mayor um, the fact that she's ours it, it's just so special and rewarding and, and and looking back I can't even imagine that we even considered selling her at the time um, so she she ran second uh, in the distaff and then you know you're confirmed for for a five-year-old uh, campaign and and you really uh, went after a big one in, in Saudi Arabia 20 million dollars for the Saudi Cup we're gonna bring up footage of that um, in a second and I would think Jeff once the decision was as a five-year-old and here we see it now and she's basically last entering when the real running kind of begins Jeff this was a monster run to to basically be chasing you know maximum security turning for home in a 20 million dollar race yeah and at that part of the race one might have thought geez this wasn't the greatest decision in the world that we made but um, I will say um, she traveled over there in such great shape. I mean, she's just shown that she adapts to any situation so well. Nothing phases her. So we knew that we had her right, and and if things went right, you know, we'd have a shot to, to run big in a race like this. And you know, I always um, pay attention to Mike Smith when he's on her back, and kind of just watch the subtle things that he's doing on her. And you could tell that Mike, you know was in a spot where he had a lot of horse and it was just a matter of when am I going to go and where am I going to go with her and when she started to roll there was a point when she hit just a few jumps after ending in the stretch and I thought now these are some really good horses that are in front of her but I think she can run them down and um, I'll tell you when, when we got within just 10 jumps from the wire there was a moment where and I'm even getting goosebumps now I thought to myself I, we're going to take down the world's most lucrative horse race against the world's best horses with Midnight Bizu. And, you know, at the end of the day, we were just a, a jump short. But to finish second in that important race against those good horses was such a, a, a great validation for the level of, of uh, talent that this filly has. And she, so she comes back in the, in the Fleur de Lis. We'll bring video of that up. Um, on the same card that that Tom's Day Tie won the won the Foster and Jeff, I mean, you owned a lot of horses in, in your time. I can't possibly imagine uh, you've ever won a, a bigger race so easily. This was just a dominant, dominant effort with with literally no. I mean, she's just cantering basically. Yeah, you know, and that to me stands out of as one of my all time favorite favorite races. Um, on her resume just for so many different reasons because you're right you know when you're running against graded state company that those races are tough and it was it was a lot to ask of midnight off the layoff um, coming from the other side of the world and um, to, to, to respond that way so easily when, when Mike kind of got her going and she made that middle move which which really watching it seems so early and then to conti continue to go and sustain that drive and draw away the way she did just instilled so much confidence in our continued um, understanding of her ability and the fact that this is a filly that seems to actually be getting better and one of the first things Mike said to me following the race was that's the best this filly's ever felt which imagine knowing what she's already done sure. previous to that um, to come into this campaign knowing that the Phillies doing that much better was was so exciting and um, you know makes us feel a whole lot better coming into the race today uh, you mentioned Mike Smith a few times and, and because of um, the world we're living in right now Mike won't be here today Ricardo Santana who's you know ridden countless uh, winners for Steve Asmussen takes over um, is it 
I don't want to say a worry, Jeff. Do you have 1% of concern? I know she's a veteran, and Ricardo's won a lot of big races. He won a grade one up here last week. Is, is she a, a horse that it takes any getting used to, or is this kind of business as usual? It's always, a, you know, it's a variable added into the mix. You know, something's changing, but she's not a difficult horse to ride. And what makes things a little bit easier is the fact that Ricardo knows the filly. He's been on her back in the morning for numerous workouts. So he's gotten a chance to get a feel for how she carries herself, how she responds, what her mouth feels like. And, you know, even Ricardo going into some of these races has, um, you know, discussed things with Mike, you know, telling him about her training. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's a shame that, that, Due to the COVID restrictions, Mike was unable to travel here, but we, we certainly feel confident in, in Ricardo's abilities and the fact that he already knows the filly and, and has such a strong relationship and rapport with Steve. Uh, Jeff, before I, I let you go, I'll, I'll put you on the spot a little bit. A lot of people, you know, off that fleur de lis were clamoring. Is she going to run in the Whitney? What's, what's going to happen? Well, she's in the personal ensign as a heavy favorite. Um, going forward, I, you know, you've run in the money twice in the Breeders' Cup this staff. Um, do you have a plan in mind, Jeff? Or is obviously, you know, how the Phillies doing and all that. But in the perfect world, uh, do you have a, a plan to which race you want to run in at Keeneland if, if all things are being equal? Well, look, I, I, well, the, the plan is, as you said, focused and getting to um, the Breeders' Cup in November. But I, I would not be afraid to run against the boys in any way, shape, or form. But, but to answer specifically, um, it's the goal is the Breeders' Cup, and, mm -hmm. and we'll let the filly dictate, you know, to us what what seems to be the right uh, race at the Breeders' Cup, whether it's the Distaff or the Classic. Fortunately, we know she can handle that kind of, uh, you know, competition. She's run against the boys, and you know, I've always maintained that there are no distance limitations with Midnight Bizu, and she's obviously answered that question time and time again. So. Um, you know, I would I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't intrigued and excited about the notion of maybe going in the classic and running against the boys. But but we'll do what's right by the Philly, and and we'll see how things play out. So it's a, a race by race situation right now. We're focused on the personal ensign, and uh, we'll see how it goes from there. Yeah, it makes makes perfect sense. Uh, Midnight Bees, you a heavy favorite in today's uh, to defend her title. Uh, in the personal ensign. Jeff, uh, last one before uh, we let you go. And it's great to be talking about grade one races and, and champions and things like that. But uh, apparently, uh, if I'm looking to see some 70s or uh, 80s rocking out in California, um, I need to have you on speed dial. Is that correct? <laughs> Back in the day, that might have been the case. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we had a blast, you know, for a number of years there at Del Mar kicking off the season with our our parties at the historic uh, belly up and i know some of your friends have been fortunate enough to come out at the right time and enjoy those parties but well, fortunately uh, or unfortunately you know, depending on <laughs> i'm sorry fortunately or unfortunately depending on <laughs> which yeah, way you look at it <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um kidding aside jeff bloom co-owner of uh, midnight bijou jeff thanks a ton for taking the time today uh on a busy Grade 1 Saturday in Saratoga. Best of luck today in the personal ensign and certainly going forward as well. Well, I appreciate it so much. Thanks for having me and uh, great talking to you. All right, Jeff Bloom, co-owner of Midnight Bijou, a heavy, heavy favorite to defend her title in the personal ensign and, and really kind of kickstart what, what could be a huge second half of the year for her and, and really for racing because as you heard Jeff allude to uh, he wouldn't be scared about taking on the boys and if that's in the Breeders Cup Classic or what have you racing always likes to to play up those kind of uh, male versus female things and, and Midnight Bijou as, as Jeff said and certainly her form and her, her fleur de lis indicated seemingly better than ever and uh, it's great that uh, as racing fans I know we can't be over there watching today but uh, Midnight Bijou in the personal ensign and then a little bit later Tom's Day Ta uh, in the Whitney. So just the, the stars, as always, are here at Saratoga. So what that's going to do is bring us to our next break here on Saturdays at the Spa. When we come back, Joe Christofek of Churchill Downs will be talking Kentucky shippers, some horses today uh, on the card, and just kind of going over, you know, we see a lot of horses from different circuits coming in as a handicapper. How do you kind of approach them uh, in their new surroundings? So stay tuned, Joe Christofek, when we come back. 
No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. You'll get live streaming, past performances, race replays, our virtual tote board, analysis and selections from professional handicappers, a simple, safe, and secure wagering platform, and best of all, you get track prices. CapitalOTBBet.com. Bet any place, anytime at CapitalOTBBet.com. And be sure to download our new mobile app from the iTunes Store or Google Play. In a recent study of some of the top online wagering sites, Capital OTB won big in total player rewards, far surpassing some of the best-known wagering sites in America. While other rewards programs simply offer you points redeemable for gift cards, Capital OTB's rebates are paid to you in actual cash. Plus, Capital OTB gives you full and immediate access to your money. So if all you're getting now are points and gift cards, join Capital OTB Player Rewards today and get cash back. Visit CapitalOTBBet.com and sign up today. Here in upstate New York, no one provides bettors with more wagering options than Capital OTB. Our network of ranch and easy bet locations stretches from the mid-Hudson Valley all the way to the Canadian border and west to central New York. So whether you need to place a bet, fund your Capital Bets account, or watch the next big race, all the action is just around the corner. A full list of our branch and easy bet locations can be found online at CapitalOTB.com. Capital OTB, the better and most convenient choice for wagering in upstate New York. Welcome back to Saturdays at the Spa. Brian Natto with you on a, just a beautiful Whitney day. Um, I, I, you know, can't go to the track, but it doesn't mean you can't get out here, get up to Saratoga. All the branches are open as well. Capital OTB bet. You can fire up the phone about and all that good stuff. Our buddy Seth Marrow is going to be over at the Embassy Suites today with a bankroll. Uh, Stuart and the gang do a great job over there. So uh, check it out. I'll be over there with some, with some friends and uh, throwing popcorn and heckling Seth a little bit. So, uh, Al Stahl started us off with Tom's Day Ta uh, in, the, in the Whitney and then followed up by Jeff Bloom, co-owner of Midnight Bijou in the Personal Ensign. And it's a pretty decent segue to bring in one of my good friends and uh, Churchill Downs analysis, uh, Joe Christofek. And Joe, welcome. Thank you, first and foremost, for, for making the time uh, on, on a Saturday. And um, looking pretty good. I know you had some reservations about that. <laughs> but uh, you of all people would know... Um, Tom State Todd, Midnight Bees are pretty front and center, and uh, you can I guess we can start about talking about two of the bigger stars that uh, you saw this, this year at Churchill. Yeah, I mean, they both raced on the same day, and both horses absolutely put on a show. Tom State Todd did run significantly faster than Midnight Bees, but neither one of the horses really had to try all that hard, so I thought they were both ultra-impressive, and uh, I expect huge performances from both of them again today. Well, we showed it earlier, but we'll bring up the footage of uh, Tom's Data winning the Foster, and, and, and I asked Al Stahl, he was on uh, to start the show right here with me, um, you know, as good as Tom's Data is and has been, um, I said to Al, and I would think you would agree, Joe, this just brought it to a different level. I think what brought it to a different level even before this was the Clark last November. Uh, I, I can't remember a dirt horse as a six-year-old improving going into their seven-year-old year. I mean, it really, I don't think this horse gets the respect he deserves. I mean, if you remember last year in the Breeders' Cup Classic, he was like an afterthought, right? He had a good year last year. But when he won the Clark, man, it was unbelievable. He won that race under wraps. He had no business winning the Oak Lawn Mile, short stretch mile, sloppy racetrack. I left at the start, was completely up against it. He wins that. And then he wins the Stephen Foster, similarly to the way he won the Clark. Got a great trip, but uh, you know, ran significantly faster than Midnight Bisu and didn't even try in doing it. 
Uh, race sets up perfect for him today. He's run well at Saratoga before. He's trained at this racetrack. He's got an outside post with some speed in front of him, and he's tactical. I, I'm, I'm looking very forward to today. I know there's other horses that people think are bettable in there, but to me, he's an absolute single. Uh, I'm with you 100%. Um, I picked it. I just, I think in a race like this with a short field, I don't think it does anyone any good to, you know, let's just, just for easy purposes, you make a $50 exact at Tom's Data over two horses. I don't think that's good betting advice or strategy. I, to me, it's a one punch to the hoop with by my standards in second. He ran well in the Foster. Al, like I said, was with me. He thought maybe he'll get a little more of an aggressive ride today. Um, under Jose Ortiz. I thought he was fine in the Foster. He came up against a better horse that day, but I do like him second best in here. It's strange because uh, during the pandemic, as you know, we didn't have any fans at Churchill, but I was walking out to do the interview and Al was watching the Foster with his family by one of the TV, so I actually watched it with him. We were both shocked that he got that perfect pressing trip through those slow fractions, and by my standards, his connections were not happy with the ride. He's going to be more aggressive. He's got the rail by my standards, ran the best race of his career, and it was still four lengths short to Tom Zeta, who won for fun. So I think that kind of sort of tells you a lot. Yeah, that's a little frightening when you've got to come back up against uh, the, the same one that just kind of whacked you around a little bit. Um, before we get into actual horses today, Joe, on the card, um, talk a little bit about, you know, you, you are front and center at Churchill Downs, Kentucky Racing. Uh, but in, and you obviously handicap a lot, so you have to do it with all sorts of horses. What about horses coming to your circuit from a different one? As handicappers here, we're still pretty early on in the Saratoga meet. Um, any words of wisdom for, for the people at, at home that are kind of looking at these horses, maybe for the first time, and, and how do they evaluate them, especially from Churchill, but even as a whole, Joe? Yeah, I mean, for me, I follow Kentucky racing almost exclusively. So it's Churchill, Keeneland, and then Ellis Park and Kentucky Downs, Turfway to a certain extent, although I'm at fairgrounds during those months following those races. So the more knowledge you have and the more intimate knowledge you have about the horses you're looking at, the better chance you have in these multi-race sequences, which horses to use, which horses to, to, to throw out. So for me, when I'm looking at Kentucky horses going to Saratoga, horses that maybe are pointing to the Saratoga meet, horses that have run well there in the past, horses that are training over that racetrack at Saratoga after running in Kentucky, uh, either uh, Churchill Downs, Keeneland, or both. I think those are big advantages. And then my advantage following the Kentucky races, track biases and track trips, uh, trip notes for every race, I take them uh, you know, religiously knowing strength of field, knowing how the race is played out, knowing how those horses compare to some of the horses that are based in New York and racing this summer at Saratoga. I think the more knowledge you have about all the horses in the race and the sequence that's in front of you, the better chance that you have to put a winning ticket. The first one we're going to talk about, we're going to bring up uh, footage of, of King Cause uh, earlier in the year in May at, at Churchill, kind of coming from the back to run second. I, this is a race, race two here at Saratoga. Um, I, I kind of thought a race that was there for the taking, Joe, and I almost picked King Cause. I ultimately picked him in second. Did, did, did he have a little trip this day? Or the, I know the third place finisher came back to win. Um, he looks very competitive first time Tom Amos here today. Yeah, I mean, look at those races at Tampa where he won two in a row and he had that big figure on March 6th, took some time off, transferred Barnes, and then he ran a huge race behind Ramsey Solution who went gate to wire through slow fractions on May 25th, and he had trouble two or three times during the race. Steadied, shuffled on the turn, rallied off heels, in tight in the stretch, and still sustained that bid to the wire. Pace compromised as well. Uh, Tom likes to win races at Saratoga. He knows which horses to bring there. I think he's got a couple of live horses on the card today, and a 10 to one uh, in the morning line in this race against this competition. I like his chances to run a huge race. Yeah, I think he fits very nicely. He certainly fits on paper. Maybe, um, as you mentioned, Ramsey Solutions a very, very nice horse, and and I and I said hierarchy came back. Uh, to win as well, so I, I think he fits in a, in a short field that, that could lead to kind of a bunched finish a little later on in the card, and we're going to, a little bit, in a few minutes, we'll talk about your pick five that you put together, but race six kicks off the pick five, 
And, and Cool Bobby comes in from Churchill off just a, a laugher in the slop. This is a good one to, to look at for many, many different reasons, Joe. We're going to bring it up. I mean, he absolutely aired in the slop. It's going to be fast today. Um, how does Cool Bobby, tra I mean, he's run well on, on a fast main track before. Um, this was a huge effort. Track aided, Joe? What do you think? Well, like we talked about earlier, if you're looking at a Midnight Beast or a Tom's Dayton, you're playing multi-race sequences, and you like those horses, depending on how many tickets you're putting together, you got to single them. You can't go two or three deep in those races and extend how much you're going to spend in these sequences and then get the two to five, three to five, four to five favorite to win. In this race, I think Everfast is the, is the horse to beat. Uh, he did run very well. Uh, over the short stretch mile of Oak Lawn and again in the blame stakes and then the makers mark mile I think is a toss out so sure. he's the horse to beat I think he fits well at seven furlongs but in this kind of race I like, like to try to lock it up meaning using Everfast and in this case using Cool Bobby who did win by 10 lengths the favor that day did not show up at all the rock says he was the odds on favorite did not run well that particular day but if you look back at Cool Bobby's races at Santa Anita and Del Mar, he ran some very fast races. You know he's capable. He won that last race for fun. He was eased under the finish line for Cherie DeVoe. And I think as the likely third choice in the race, uh, five to one in the morning line, I think is more than fair. This is a horse that I would certainly use in multi-race sequences along with Everfast. But this is a horse I might bet based on the potential value. All right, so Joe's got 3-7. We'll put his ticket up here in a second. His That middle pick five. Don't forget, it's not the late pick five. It's the middle pick five. Joe put together a $63 ticket. Here we go. Thank you, Brock, for $0.50. Cents. I, just looking at your ticket, the obvious one I want to talk about, because I agree with you that Tom's Day Toss is single, and you're spreading a little bit in race, six and, race 7 and race 8. So let's jump to the grade 1 Jerkins. It's the last race of this particular sequence. You've got a deep spread in there, Joe, seven of them. I, I see it the same way in that I want coverage in there. I mean, you've got a 50 to 1 down inside Hopeful Treasure as part of your brigade. Talk um, about the Jerkins, and, and, you know, it's safe to say you agree with me in that it's a lot more wide open than just no parole, straight uh, wire job again. Yeah, I use no parole on the ticket defensively because if I get there, no parole wins. You know, at least with a $63 investment, it's not yeah. going to kill me to make a couple hundred bucks on the pick five. But, yeah, I mean, I went with shoplifted. I went with three technique. Uh, Tap it to win is going to be a lot of tickets. On a lot of tickets, I used him. Mischievous Alex can improve second off the layoff. Echo Town can certainly turn the tables. And then you mentioned the 50 to 1 hopeful treasure. He ran some pretty fast races as a two year old and early in his three year old season. The gold fever, I'm not going to count against him. 50 to 1 in the morning line seems a little bit high to me. And I just think this race might have the recipe for chaos. So of the long, 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 long shots, that's the one I decided to include. But I could see no parole winning. Obviously, he had things in his favor in the Woody Stevens. And uh, that might not be the case today. And he's never run over this racetrack. So we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, I said to Anthony Mormino on the, on the handicappers report, if they let no parole walk again on the front end, there, there's got to be an investigation or something because there's a lot of speed in here and after what he just did in the Woody Stevens they are supposed to go after him and it's nothing should be free today in the Jerkins. Yeah I've seen this horse since the beginning of his career at Fairgrounds. He's uh, Louisiana bred. Tom Amos was always high on him. Obviously as a talented three-year-old you gotta try to find out if you can stretch out. He found out pretty quickly that this is a one-turn horse. Seven furlongs is probably his limit. He's super talented, and he's got the best speed in the field. But there are a lot of horses that should be able to take early, middle, and late shots at him. As the favorite, uh, i got to try to find a price in here. Joe, it's uh, August 1st, and normally you would probably be a lot more... Uh, relax, but uh, this year and this uh, we've got uh, Kentucky Derby to talk about. So before I, I let you go, um, it's it's coming up fast. What do we got? Four weeks, um, five weeks from today, uh, the Derby in September. What what are you looking at right now? Five weeks away. You know, I know we can talk about Tisla Law, we can talk about Honor AP, but uh, who out there maybe is anybody off your radar? You're front and center about all this. I know you like art art collector, correct? Yeah, I've liked Art Collector uh, for quite a while. I've had Tiz a long number one on my list 
since the beginning, even after, you know, he didn't win at Churchill last fall, obviously had a major excuse and he's done absolutely nothing wrong since. And I think he's the uh, undisputed number one right now. We'll see what Honor AP obviously does against the short field this weekend. Um, I like to root for the little guy, man. I know Tommy Drury, he's a great horseman. He's a great dude. He has done a great job with Art Collector. And uh, it's nice to see the little guy with a nice horse. Obviously, you know, we run a stable of horses, brilliant race, and we've got three very capable trainers that, that we use. And, you know, it's nice to see uh, the little guy, so to speak. I mean, Tommy's been a great trainer for a long time, 20, 25%. But nobody knows his name because he's been training on the smaller circuits. Our collector has done nothing wrong. He's got tactical speed. We know he likes Churchill Downs. Now, Tommy's going to run him in the Ellis Park Derby thinking he needs to run, which leads me to believe that he's kicking down the stall, sure. which isn't necessarily a bad sign. And I think he can get the mile and a quarter distance the first Saturday in September. So that's who I'm rooting for with my heart. Uh, Tis the law, the one to beat with my head right now. Well, let me ask you a question, Joe. I've, I've had some good discussions with, with, with friends about uh, the Derby this year. From your opinion, is it going to be easier or harder to win? Because we're seeing, you know, a horse like Art Collector isn't even running in the Derby in May. You know, we have Tis the law, we had Honor AP, but those late developers, are they going to, I would think they're going to add, now our collector's certainly up here now, but some of those horses are going to add to the belly of this race that might not have been, uh, certainly might not have been in the race, but especially not as developed as they would have been uh, on the first Saturday in May. So your estimation, Joe, easier or harder to win a derby on September 5th? Um, you know, it's more like the Travers than it is the Kentucky Derby, mm -hmm. right? You get those late developing horses. For sure. Uh, I would say it's probably a little bit easier, though, because we've had so many good ones yeah. off the path. We've had so many good ones join the brigade. But if you look at the Derby, you know, you're looking four or five deep at the top end of it. So tis the law. Would the race have been tougher in May? I mean, it's hard to say. But it's harder in a way, Brian, because they had to keep tis the law in form and come up with a new plan to get to the first Saturday in September. They've done a great job, but the horse has uh, obviously been complimentary towards that, and that isn't always the case as we've seen on the path this year. Yeah, for sure, and I think it's exciting, if nothing less, that it, there is that new dynamic um, this year. Joe, you, in the past uh, two or three years, you've, you've delved into um, racetrack uh, ownership and brilliant racing that, that's that's enjoyed some success with with a limited amount of, of starters um give the people a little bit of an idea about brilliant racing what you're trying to do i know you uh are at the absolute top of the list when it comes to you know racetrack ambassadorship if that's a word uh getting new people into the game uh this game we love so much you have really kind of grabbed the bull by the horns there What's with Brilliant Racing? How's it been going? And, and I would think that's the perfect opportunity for folks that want to get involved in racing. Yeah, we have uh, three partnerships. We just bought three two-year-olds at the uh, Ocala two-year-old in training sale, which obviously got pushed back uh, from April uh, to June. And we're excited about them. But we had a really nice um, filly by the name of Yes, It's Ginger win at Ellis Park in a fast time. Uh, breaking her maiden off a 13-month layoff a couple of weeks ago. We think she's good enough to get some black type. We paid 40000 for her out of the last crop, uh, crop of Yes, It's True. Uh, Eskin Ford is probably our most famous horse for winning the Indiana Derby without a jockey <laughs> uh, last year. He's kind of become a fan favorite. But, Brian, we've got about 150 members in the three partnerships. You know, members, their family, their friends, they all get excited about it. And for me doing my job to see how it works from the time you buy the two-year-olds to developing them to figuring out what spots to put them in, it helps me do my job as a racing analyst because I think it gives me a very unique perspective. Yeah, I mean, we, a couple of my good friends, Brian and Wayne, Gene Kirshner is involved as well. And like you said, it's friends, family, and all, all sorts of uh, outside-the-box people as well. If, if You can give a shout-out, Joe, if they want to get involved. Is it, I know you have... Uh, kind of a manager as well. Where, where can people go if they want to get involved in brilliant racing? Yeah, Brandon Stovall, who's a private clocker, who's got a great eye for horses, and Natalie Gills, who also has a great eye for horses, are managing partners. It's brillianthorseracing.com. 
We're thinking about maybe doing some yearling stuff, uh, Keeneland September, which would be short notice, but we think there might be some opportunities there. Otherwise, it'll be the two-year-old in training sale. We'll get the fourth partnership going uh, sometime around December. I'll start formulating that. But uh, again, you buy in one unit, uh, has been $2,500. You get interest in three different horses. If you buy one horse, you never know when that horse might not be able to make the races or gets hurt. This way you've got interest in three horses, which means you're probably going to be running one, two, or maybe all three of them at any given time. And like I said, it's a family atmosphere. We do a great, great job with the communication and uh, we try to make it fun and affordable for everybody. And most importantly, uh, transparent because when you're owning horses, I think that's the most important aspect. Yeah. And, and the partnership has really become in vogue in the last, I don't, I'd say 15, 10, 15 years. And I had, uh, Tommy Bellhouse, one of my favorite people, you know, West Point uh, thoroughbreds, and they, they, they certainly play at the high level, but as you mentioned, um, the, the beauty of the partnership does means you don't have to spend $80,000 or what have you on a horse. You can get involved, three horses, a lot of bang for your buck, and, and I know you can speak of this, Joe, as, as it's happened to you. They're, seeing your horse win, there's no, no better feeling, and it's the, the beauty of this game. I mean, look what Jeff Bloom did with Midnight Bisu, right? What did they pay for her? 80000 80. You know, you see this all the time. Swiss Skydiver, 37000 I mean, you can get horses that are good uh, for a reasonable amount of money, and we think we've done a good job picking up our horses. We've had some success. We think we're set up for a good rest of the 2020 season. And for me, going back to the barn and getting to know the horses uh, intimately, seeing them come into the paddock, watching them compete, and then like you said, there's no feeling like watching them win. Until you do it, you really don't know what it's like. And uh, to me, it's special. I think it uh, adds a lot to your day-to-day -day existence if you love horse racing, particularly if you love all aspects of it. The horse, the race, you know, maybe playing the races a little bit as well. Uh, I think to get involved at a low level and get a taste of it is something that everybody should try to do uh, if they have that opportunity with people that they trust. Great to hear and continued success. Joe Christofek, uh, the paddock analyst at Churchill Downs. Derby's coming up front and center and gave us some thoughts today as well on a few Churchill runners. They'll be, they'll be uh, throughout the meet, not as many as in years past. But, Joe, I want to give you a special thanks for stopping by. Uh, best of luck going forward with the Derby and certainly brilliant racing. Yeah, Brian, great job as always, and uh, always good to catch up, and best of luck to everybody out there. Should be a fantastic day, star-studded day. Get to see some tremendous performances and hopefully uh, cash a few tickets too. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Chris Defect is going to wrap it up uh, today on Saturdays at the Spa. As I mentioned you know, every week, thanks so much for uh, the people that have stopped by and take the time out uh, on a Saturday morning. Uh, Al Stahl, third year in a row, Al sat next to me, and we wish him all the best. One of them. Anthony Mormino said this, he's known him said for 25 years, one of the best guys you're ever going to meet um, in racing, class, nice, and, and, and so we appreciate him stopping by. Jeff Bloom as well, co-owner uh, of Midnight Bijou up here in Saratoga, she's going to be a heavy favorite uh, in the personal ensign as well. And then uh, Joe Christofek, as I mentioned, paddock analyst at Churchill Downs. Uh, Mr. Kentucky Derby, uh, which which is a, is a thing this year. So we're going to talk about that uh, a lot going forward. Uh, I'm going to have Jeremy Plonk, a force player now on the show, uh, in a couple weeks. He does count down to the crown because the Derby is uh, something that we're all looking forward to in this weird and, and, and wacky world. And certainly the Travers next week with Tis the Law and the Sacatoga boys um, looking to, to the only horse that can win a Triple Crown this year and bark down that path. Um, and add the Travers to an already uh, burgeoning resume and that started with the Belmont Stakes. So a lot to look forward to here at Saratoga. Whitney Day today, a monster card with all the stakes, all the grade one races, the champions or champions in the making that are here. I know you can't get here to the track. It doesn't mean you can't come up to Saratoga. It doesn't mean you can go to the, all the OTB branches, fire up the uh, account, capitalotbbets.com. Enjoy a great day at Saratoga. Take care. Been watching Saturdays at the Spa with Brian Nadow. Saturdays at the Spa has been brought to you by CapitalOTBBet.com, New York's premier wagering site. 
capital otbbet.com sign up today the new capital mobile app wager anywhere anytime download it free from the itunes store or google play